Uh, thank you very much for having me here today. It's a great honor and a pleasure to join you again. I think this is my third time, and it gets better and better. We have more to do, uh, but we also have more to show. And uh, you will see uh, advances that we have made um, over the last several years in my talk. I'd like uh, organizers to uh, accept my uh, gratefulness for inviting me all the time. Um, I think this is one of the major meetings that I would love not to miss because this is where I get the most uh, uh, reflection on what we actually do in the clinic from the patients themselves. So I like to engage as much as I can and please ask me any questions. Interrupt me if you don't understand my English. Uh, and write down all the questions later on. I'd like to engage and uh, uh, answer them all. So this is going to be really, uh, as it says here, a practical uh, approach uh, to uh, use of a jack inhibitors to understand well, uh, to extend possible, what do they do, uh, and uh, who are the good patients for this therapy, uh, how long the therapy lasts, and, and other issues for everyday practice. Really not about much of the, about the future, but let's focus on now. So myelofibrosis, there are a few slides in the beginning just as the introductory slides, and maybe some of these slides you have seen before. I apologize for that, but it's always good to repeat. There are always new patients and family members around. So this is a bone marrow slide. You see all these uh, brown or black streaks. These are the cells that we are talking about. These are fibers, right? These are fibrotic bone marrow that limits the growth of the, the uh, reddish uh, uh, stuff there. These are the cells, actually. So as you get uh, uh, through the disease process, this uh, brown takes over more and more, and this is fibrosis that we talk about. Body reacts to the presence of fibrosis in a bone marrow in an unusual way, and you get a big spleen in about 80 to 90 percent of the patients. And this would be uh, probably about 20 size, the normal size of the spleen that you can usually feel. This one is obvious from the door. You don't need to measure it. About 40 percent of the patients will have a very big liver as well. This is a slide of the blood, and these are some somehow pale cells, and indeed most of the patients develop anemia. About a third of the patients will become transfusion dependent significantly. And then the, what else you see in the blood is these funny cells that you don't usually see in blood. These are cells that come from the bone marrow. These are blasts, metamouses, promouses, all these funny names that describe the types of cells that we see usually in bone marrow. But we think in a simple way, that because of fibrosis, they are pushed out into the blood and you see bone marrow cells in the blood. And we always worry about these blasts. These are baby cells that nobody likes to have very high number because if they go above 20%, either in blood or bone marrow, then we say that patients has transformed to acute leukemia and it's more aggressive. So this is why we look at that as well. Only about the 15 to 20% of the patients will transform to acute leukemia. Most of the other patients will suffer from the disease itself and will have a shorter life expectancy than normal. Unfortunately, average life expectancy for the patients with malfibrosis is about five to seven years. Looking back, we were able in uh, our uh, databases to find prognostic factors that uh, uh, would tell us semi-intelligently in a way what would be projected survival of the patients at the time of diagnosis. I always say this is something from the past. It doesn't apply anymore, but we have to prove it, it doesn't. It's still in use, um, and it's a valid tool to assess the, the risk of early death, untimely death of the patients, based on five factors, as you can see, listed on the left side. Obviously, age is one. Others are related to the blood findings, but one that I like to point out is constitutional symptoms. This is one of the rare diseases where the presence of constitutional symptoms. What are the constitutional symptoms? These are bone aches and pains, itching, sweating, uh, weight loss, uh, low-grade fevers. So systemic symptoms from the disease um, are present. They are bad prognostic factors, a factor. For example, you would have a patient that have none of these factors. That is a low-risk patient. And on the, on the graph, that would be the curve most to the uh, right, the longest survival, about 11 years. Let's say you have a patient who is 60 years of age, have a relatively good count, no anemia, leukocytosis is not present, no blast, but has a bad, bad uh, night sweating and weight loss. Because of these constitutional symptoms, the patient's survival is shorter for three years. This would be intermediate one group. 
right there, eight years instead of 11. So I point out these constitutional symptoms as a significant factor, not just in affecting the quality of life of the patients, but also affecting the survival of the patients. It's one of the prognostic factors. We use this uh, system mostly in a clinic to assess the risk of early death and uh, refer a patient to a transplant, which is the only way to eliminate disease that we know of and uh, cure patients, and usually patients with high risk that have a survival of about two years and intermediate two risk, about a four-year survival, are those referred for a transplant. We'll talk about intermediate one a lot, but patients that are low risk, don't have even symptoms, and are younger, we usually don't send for the transplant. So in the clinic, usually, when you ask the doctors, when do you treat the patients? What is the reason to treat the patient with myeloid fibrosis? You cannot eliminate disease. These are the usual answers. Why would I initiate the therapy? And you see there are a number of reasons, but the most uh, striking ones are three. The most common is enlargement of the spleen or a liver. And number two would be significant anemia. And number three would be those constitutional symptoms. And usually we engage in a therapy with medications to counteract those three. And every patient is a little bit different, has a different significant anemia or a significant size of the spleen or significant constitutional symptoms, and we try to do the best we can. When you ask the patients, this is what the patient tells you. This is work of uh, my good friend Ruben Mesa in Scottsdale. Um, he uh, has done a number of good studies to assess the symptomatic burden. How bad is actually the quality of life of patients with myeloid fibrosis? How bad can it become? And the patients, uh, you see, has a significant impact in multiple areas. These are all listed here on the left side in a high proportion of the patients. And he often says that patients with advanced myeloid fibrosis have a bad quality of life as the patients uh, with the metastatic cancer of a lung or uh, pancreas or other uh, solid tumors because it's really over time affecting patients very much. Now to put the face to a, a graph, I show uh, some photos and I have uh, quite a few photos in my presentation. I hope you are not offended, but they really provide you um, with uh, what the real picture of what I'm saying. This is one of my patients. That was six years ago, as you see. Slightly enlarged spleen, traveling around, enjoying life, but the disease does progress. And it does take a tool on the body. And this is what you would see with advanced uh, phase when patients really lose weight, unable to walk much, and uh, suffer from the symptoms, blood cell count, and enlarged spleen. Now, can we do something about it? This is in the past. And I say, yes, we can. This is the same patient, just recently in, in a follow-up. Sorry, I don't have a whole body, but you can actually, I think you can picture it. Um, we can make a difference. Not for everybody, but for a good number of the patients, there is a medication, and these are JAK inhibitors, that do make a difference overall for the patient's outcome. So let's look at that in a little bit more detail, understand what exactly happens. Now, we learn in the morning session, and this is only one slide, to uh, highlight again what the problem is with the myeloproliferative diseases. We have this system where the JAK enzymes are associated with the different receptors that protrude through the cell membrane, and where these cytokines or growth factors attach. In some cases, there is a mutation in these JAKs. This is JAK2 mutation. And we heard about many other mutations that we know of now uh, present in myeloproliferative diseases. And we have this JAK stat pathway is hyperactive and making cells behave abnormally. They are malignant cells. They grow without control. So the hyperactivity of a JAK stat pathway, JAK stat pathway here, appears to be a common problem in all patients with myelofibrosis or myeloproliferative neoplasms regardless whether they have a JAK2 mutation or any of the other mutations. So when you have a, an inhibitor, inhibitor of the JAK2 then, you uh, would inhibit the JAK set pathway. These inhibitors that we have in a clinic, and there were 10 so far tested in a clinical studies, 
They are not selective for patients that have a JAK2 mutation. They are just inhibitors of the JAK2. So everybody can benefit. They uh, would not eliminate disease. They would control this hyperactivity of the jak stat pathway. And you would have an expected side effect at certain dose because they would affect the normal function of the JAK2. And normal function of the JAK2 is in our bone marrow to make some blood, red blood cells and platelets. So expected side effect as you push the dose up in a patient would be that at some point there would be significant anemia and thrombocytopenia, low red blood cells and low platelets because they are not specific for a mutated one. They do affect the normal JAK2. And this is a summary of what we would expect in a clinic from implementation of the JAK inhibitors in the patients. And pretty much this is what we see. I showed this uh, two years ago, and it is always good to show. This is a spleen that we talked about. This is a patient who is losing weight. These are the type of patients that I see commonly in my clinic about three new patients every week. Um, and it's not a nice picture, but we do make a difference. And this effect, it happens fast. The maximum benefit in a shrinking the spleen is between two and three months. And patients along the way improve their ability to walk, gain weight, and you see the ribs are not seen anymore. And these constitutional symptoms improve as well. And I'll show you more on that aspect. So, this was a study that is, I think is very important to understand when we talk about the benefits of the JAK inhibitors. Ruxolitinib is the one that has been approved now for two years, and it was compared to whatever the doctor want, wanted to do, best available therapy, any therapy that we have in a clinic to treat myelofibrosis patients. And there were 136 patients with ruxolitinib, 63 patients on best available therapy, six months randomized study. Each vertical line here, if you can see them, is one patient's response in spleen. Spleen was a size was normalized to zero, so everything going down is improvement or a smaller spleen. Going up, it's growth of the spleen over six month period. So to ruxolitinib, the refractory patients are hardly any. About 3% of the patients on ruxolitinib would not have any benefit at all. So the chance of having improvement is quite high. But the question is, what does it mean for the patients to have perhaps 20% reduction in the volume of the spleen, or 40 or 60? This was all done by MRI, by MRI testing to see the volume of the spleen rather than just palpation. And we found later and published the papers on this that as little as 10% spleen reduction is good enough for the patients to feel much better and enjoy the benefit of the drug. It's not 50% or 40% or 80%. It is as little as 10% or more. So we have a very good chance to improve patients' uh, spleen and symptoms in a large number of patients. Now, how about the symptoms? Of course, you can ask the patients how you feel, or you can deduct from your discussion how the patient fares. But there are tools that are uh, developed, and Dr. Ruben Mesa has developed some of those patient-specific questionnaires that are given to patients to answer. So this is comparison of ruxolitinib and best available therapy in different colors, improvement to the right, worsening to the left, and this is selection of some problems that are seen in patients with myelofibrosis at advanced stage. You see that majority of the things with ruxolitinib get better, but not so with the best available therapy. So combination of the two benefits, improvement in big organs, and improvement in the systemic symptoms is the benefit of the JAK inhibitors. Two go hand to hand, hand to hand. Um, and of course, uh, because most patients have both present, that is very effective then. Patients walk more. First, we found out that patients walk less than normal people of the same age that are healthy otherwise. This is a six minute walk test, very simple test. You ask the patients to, ask, uh, to walk for six minutes and then you measure the distance. And we found first that the patients walk less than normal people of, uh, of the same age that are healthy. And then on therapy, patients walk after one month, they walk 34 meters more. And you see after six months, they walk 71 meters more than at the start. Basically people regain ability to walk like healthy people. 
and they gain weight. And for most of the people, because they have lost weight, these are studies that were done in patients that lost a lot of weight already, this is very beneficial. So if you put these graphs again together in a person, I, have, I showed this uh, last time, uh, many of you probably were here two, two years ago. This is Bob. He was actually uh, in the public last time. And he, we had the pleasure of him standing up and giving us a few um, uh, jokes uh, that uh, how he recovered. So this is when he was uh, uh, in my clinic first time. In, uh, you see, April 2008. Uh, he was uh, in a wheelchair like the other patients so far. This was the picture I showed the last time. This was two weeks ago. He is actually in Japan right now. Yeah, so he's not with us. I asked him whether he would be here, but he flew to Japan. He has a grand, uh, granddaughter just born. Uh, so he is enjoying his life. Um, and again, we can make a difference. So um, I think this represents what I was showing on the graphs very well. Now, is this the drug only for patients that have a big spleen? No, it's not at all. The big spleen is present in majority of the patients. And of course, the, it would reduce the spleen, so it's good for those patients. But what about patients that don't have a big spleen and don't feel well? There are patients like that, losing weight, have fatigue, unable to walk, night sweating. We have only one paper published so far in only six patients with the experience with JAK inhibitor in this situation, but it does work. It is not tied to a spleen by any means. We treated patients without a big spleen. We treated patients that have only big liver because spleen was already taken out and it does shrink the liver as well. So it's systemic therapy that controls the growth of the cells, decreases the big organs, and affects the symptoms as anti-inflammatory medication. It's two benefits together. Anti-proliferative, eliminating or stopping the growth, and anti-inflammatory, uh, improving the symptoms. What is the problem with this drug? Well, it lowers the blood cell count in some patients because it does inhibit normal JAK2. So anemia and low platelets can happen in patients, and we doctors like to grade everything, so we say grade three or four. These are clinically relevant, meaning the patients usually need transfusions. And it happens in about 40% about, uh, of the patients uh, within first six months that have anemia, and about 12% uh, of the patients or 13% of the patients that have a thrombocytopenia. This was compared to the placebo, and indeed there is a difference. So there is a chance of worsening anemia and worsening thrombocytopenia in patients. Is the presence of anemia a contraindication to use of JAK inhibitors? It's not. One just needs to know what to do with the dose. So this is what happens on the therapy. This was the study where compared ruxolitinib to placebo, and this is a red blood cell count, hemoglobin. This is on placebo. Of course, it's not going to change. This is on ruxolitinib. It does go down, but then it goes up. Within six months, it's up. It's not as high as it was, but it's up higher than it was here during the first six months. Why is it going up? This is another look at the transfusion requirement. This is placebo patients requiring transfusions, about 25-30% of the patients on placebo needed transfusions. You see on ruxolitinib there is increase in requirement for transfusions. But it does go down to a placebo level by six months. Why is this happening? Because we adjust the dose. It's about finding the dose for each individual that works the best. Development of anemia does not affect response to ruxolitinib. I have seen too many patients where the therapy is stopped because there is a degree of anemia, and we are afraid of lowering the count. That should not be the cause for stopping the therapy. There should be attempt to modify the dose and find the dose that works best for the patient. So this is a spleen response versus placebo. Placebo is in blue, ruxolitinib was in green. Patients did develop anemia, and patients did not develop anemia because of ruxolitinib have the same response. Anemia does not compromise the benefit. The same with symptoms. 
This is improvement in the symptoms on uh, ruxolitinib versus placebo. Patients with anemia or without anemia have the same improvement in the symptoms. People always connect the anemia with fatigue. In, it doesn't appear to be the case here because patients with or without anemia have the same improvement in the blood cell count. In fact, there are a number of patients that occasionally may need transfusions but are maintained on a JAK inhibitor for the, all the benefits they gain in reducing the spleen, improving the uh, weight, ability to walk. So you balance these risks and benefits in each individual and make uh, the best you can with the list of, uh, of the harm. Now, because of those adjustments then, what do we uh, end up with after six months of therapy? This is after 24 weeks of therapy with ruxolitinib, about 150 patients. These are the doses that the patients are. There are standard starting doses in the instructions for the doctors, how to start. And this is what the patients end up with. This is percent improvement. See, 10 milligrams, 50 milligrams, 20 milligrams, and 25 milligrams twice a day. BID means twice a day. Similar improvements in the spleen. Excellent improvement in the symptoms starting with 10 twice a day or higher. After 48 weeks of therapy, 10 milligrams twice a day or higher appears the same in spleen reduction. So as a good maintenance dose, and I tell this to my colleagues in uh, everyday practice, that 10 milligrams twice a day or higher is excellent maintenance dose for the patients. You play with the dose at the beginning, adjusting as necessary, but 10 milligrams twice a day or higher is good dose, long term. What about the patients that are anemic or become anemic? Well, in the past, we always combined things together. There was no drug that would do all things at the same time. So why not combine things together? If you have a drug that improves the spleen and symptoms and patient is anemic, why not add a medication that would improve anemia potentially? So we do this by adding, at least in my clinic, I like danazole. This is like testosterone-like medication, and there are other possibilities. Or if we are worried about suppressing the, the, the blood cell count too much, you can start with the lower dose than what is recommended. You start with lower and go higher. Every month you increase the dose a little bit to avoid any significant anemia. So starting with five milligrams twice a day. The same applies to patients with low platelets. What happens if you stop the therapy? These are the symptoms of the patients. They were all normalized to zero at the beginning. Improvement in the symptoms was between 25 and 35% feeling better. When you stop therapy, the symptoms come back to baseline within seven days. And I know a number of patients here in the uh, in audience that I talk to, uh, and they know that they will feel bad within seven to 10 days again, as they felt at the beginning. The symptoms come back, so this drug really needs to be taken all the time. The one of the major problems in the community right now is that the doctors, when you see suppression of the blood cell count, they tell the patients to stop the therapy I'll see you in two weeks. We'll start again with the lower dose. In two weeks, the patient has all the symptoms back. You start with the lower dose, it doesn't work as well. Dose modifications, that's the way to go. Proactive modifications during the first two or three months where everything happens, then you find the best dose and keep the patients for long-term benefit. Is there a harm in patient's uh, life when you stop the therapy? This is so-called withdrawal syndrome which has been mentioned in a couple of papers so far, as uh, the patients actually get worse than they were at the beginning. Usually that means that patients actually get to the baseline quickly and they feel bad, and you don't want this to happen. There are only two papers that showed about six cases where the patients actually got worse than they were at the baseline, and among 10,000 patients that have been treated with JAK inhibitors so far. So what do you do about this interruption? If you need to interrupt, I would usually advise taper the medication off. Don't just stop cold turkey in a patient who has excellent response because this excellent response will be lost. In seven, 10 days, people will feel bad. Or use some prednisone, steroids, that counteract the return of the symptoms pretty well. These are little bit tricks of trade in everyday practice that make a lot of difference for individual who is uh, uh, in, a, in the hands of, of the doctor in the community. What I usually like to say is the last two bullets. In the blinded study between the ruxolitinib and placebo, the number of patients that stopped the therapy because of the side effects were the same. 
by and large, these medications are pretty good. They do what they are supposed to be doing. You manage the side effects that are usually marked by those adjustments. It's really unnecessary to discontinue early on unless there is a serious problem, which is rare. Now, are there any other benefits? This is something that is uh, coming along, and you will see this with other JAK inhibitors as well. This is a comparison observational study between uh, patients that were treated with ruxolitinib versus hydroxyurea, a chemotherapy that is commonly given to patients with uh, enlarged spleen. After 48 months of therapy, not a randomized study, just two different groups of patients on two different continents, F actually, looking at the fibrosis in the bone marrow. Most of the patients after 48 months had stable bone marrow fibrosis. A quarter of the patients on ruxolitinib had worsening. 80% on hydria had a worsening but there were 22% of the patients on ruxolitinib that had some improvement in fibrosis. How do I explain that? I don't think this is really clinically relevant. I think it's just because we are controlling the signs and symptoms of the disease very well, and you have some improvements in the bone marrow fibrosis over time. Nobody has shown that this is uh, clinically relevant, that we need to do any bone marrow biopsies over time, or things like that. It's exploratory uh, observation that we have made so far. So not for everyday practice. So the final question is then, can JAK inhibitors prolong life of patients with myeloma fibrosis? And there are curves that I can show you between uh, patients uh, that were treated with nothing and the JAK inhibitors or some best available therapy and JAK2 inhibitors, and there is always a lot of discussion. Therefore, there is a patient of mine who gave me these pictures to show you, and some of you may have seen this, and you see the date. The patient was brought to me from Oklahoma on a way to hospice with 78 pounds uh, total weight, uh, unable to walk, very big organs, pretty good counts, projected survival from the local doctor about three months. The, she was hospitalized. Of course, we couldn't do anything in outpatient setting. The patient was completely debilitated. These are her uh, extremities, as you can see. These are the ulcers from the hydroxyurea therapy. So there are patients, certainly, that we can uh, change the outcome of the patients. And uh, if you ask me whether we have a potential here to control the disease, signs and symptoms that would ultimately lead to a prolongation of life, yes. We don't need absolutely to eliminate disease to have a life extension. If you control it very well, for a good group of patients, there is a potential to improve the life expectancy. So in summary, the JAK inhibitors are not selective for the JAK mutation. You can actually treat patients with or without mutation. Low renal blood cell count is not a cause for stopping therapy. Those adjustments without any interruption is the best way to manage the patients. Who are the candidates for therapy? Those that are symptomatic, either systemic symptoms or systemic splenomegaly. Would I treat the patient who has no symptoms? No. Would I treat the patient who is only anemic and doesn't have a symptoms related to the disease otherwise or weak spleen? No. But if the patient is suffering from symptomatic splenomegaly, systemic symptoms, that would be the candidate. Even if he has anemia, I would not really hesitate to treat those two things that are present and affect the patients. Finally, I do think that there is a possibility of prolongation of life in patients with advanced disease, for sure. Where are we going? There are other JAK inhibitors that are in a pipeline. In orange, for those aficionados who like to know the details, these are the, the ones that are uh, top of the line. The last one is all, already approved for myelofibrosis, right now in approval process for PV. But the momelotinib, pacritinib, and fedratinib, and you need to learn these names very fast, uh, they are in phase three ongoing studies, as you can see. One for fedratinib was already completed, so we may have more choices than one, which is very good. Not every patient is the same, not every drug is the same. In fact, what I think will really uh, influence how they are used and who is given one of those, if they all get to the market, who knows, is uh, the toxicity profile. They are a little bit different. These are all mild, 
mild toxicities, but there are some differences among them. They're easy to uh, handle by adjusting the dose, like we said for anemia or platelets, or uh, giving supportive medications for the nausea or diarrhea that comes with these two. So this may affect the, their real utility because by and large their bottom line is similar. Where are we going? We want to improve the benefit scene. We want to bring additional benefits. We want to reduce the side effects. And most importantly is we want to improve the stem cell transplant success. There are already papers in press where the patients who were very sick with big spleen, poor quality of life, unable to walk, given the JAK inhibitors for three months, you turn them around, patients uh, gain weight, walk more, the spleen is smaller, symptoms are gone. Now they are transplant candidates and the transplant can be done. So I think this will have a major impact on our ability to do good transplants in these patients and actually cure them. So that's the ultimate goal. I thank you very much for your attention.